So this is a Microsoft Edge case. We built it in our basement. Um, well, I built it with a, another team uh, of, of an agency called We Make Awesome Shh. We Make Awesome Shh. And they have an Italian domain name. <laughs> What's that? We Make Awesome Shh. It's funny now, but it's not so funny when you're trying to get them pre approved at Microsoft's uh, contractor. Oh, We Make Awesome Shh. Anyway, so this is, we've got this over a week it took. It's actually, this particular machine's built on Linux. Um, we've built a version on Windows, talk, uh, Windows 10 IoT. Fundamentally, it's the biggest Raspberry Pi, I think, anywhere in the world. It's got a load of Arduinos unnecessarily on this machine as well. Um, and it might surprise you what it's intended to do, because it's quite ridiculous what it's intended to do. Probably more surprise you how the hell I got budget for it. But um, if I went over here and we did Output will go uh, the or and we'll press oh, switch all these switches down because that's an important part. Yeah. Press go, prepare the initialization sequence. The modem connects up to the internet, <laughs> starts dialing. It goes and fetches, uh, goes to uh, Joomla.org, gets the CSS, the HTML, and the JavaScript from that side. It calls an Azure API, that API takes all that stuff, looks over, runs a number of different tests against it, it runs browser detection tests, and uh, then it generates a little report on its receipt. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what this Microsoft Edge case does. We take it to events and people come along and they can put their websites into it and they can determine. Actually, Joomla.org passes all six of the main test groups. There's about 48 different tests when you run over it. But there's lots of people which come and they pick it to dark places, this machine. It's been taken to adult websites on the internet. We've added a, a content filter to it and all sorts of things we've done with this machine. But what I noticed rather peculiarly is when people had port numbers, it was behaving really oddly. So if they put like, port 8080 on, on the end of their URL, I was getting bugs that would crash out at events. So I started to investigate. And I wrote into the... Uh, so if we just go into... Um, uh, oh my gosh. That's how you reboot uh, this Linux machine. <laughs> takes a little bit of time to, to load it. I sometimes get kernel panic and I've got no reason or understanding exactly why. But it's possibly because there's loads of metal and this plasma ball interfering. In fact, if you touch this, you get a little bit of an electric shock. Just updating my brain, that's what it's doing is getting a git pull. It's a git pull from GitHub, it gets the latest version of the code. It's actually a Node.js application which is running on the machine. Hopefully, <coughs> up, we should see some light soon. Updating my brain. It should say, uh, put them on my clothes. Come on. Don't let me down now, machine. Put them on my clothes. The application should start up. So then I tried uh, Microsoft.com and I put in a port number, 1996. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been paradox, paradox resolved. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Actually, scrap that panic. Uh, your www is now in 1996. <laughs> so I went over to my. Uh, my computer which is on the same network as that uh, machine. I went to news.bbc.co.uk. Oh, I didn't. That was later. <laughs> <laughs> the only website I know in 1996 was this one, spacejam.com. Anyone remember spacejam.com? And I know it's 1996 because if you go to spacejam.com, it forms you some Warner Brothers now. So something strange was happening. I was going, maybe using the Wayback machine or something like that. I thought it was really odd. I thought it was quite strange that I could somehow transport to 1996. Oop, <coughs> so I thought, well, maybe I could go forward. So let's try this. So microsoft.com 2020. <laughs> On the internet, information superhighway road detected. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Black hole open, VPN connected to 2020, creating an ISDN connection. Your so WW is now in 2020. So if I go to my website now, that's the BBC website, we can see that the news has been updated to 2020. There's a few things that have changed. It has now been going to 
Stop it! Stop it! Odd stuff happening in 2020. Only the background story, but I know it's got something to do with the story and conflict of Iron Brew. Anyway, Kanye West, he's now the President of the United States. <laughs> You're worried about Trump? Jeez! Um, all sorts of stuff which is happening on this, on this website. Tumble Drive becomes self aware in 2020. <laughs> Image held the elves released after years of captivity by Browser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to know. It's so, alright, we finally let them go in 2020. Microsoft will bring it together and release it. Yeah, so um, this is strange. <laughs> it's okay. Um, um, what, what, the things that I was kind of thinking about when I was, I was looking on it is, well, now I've got this portal to the, to the next version of the internet, 2020, I could find all sorts of things. I could go to, you know, I could probably go to sports sites and find out what and then bet on. Or I could find out how they put intranet websites together. I could find out how they put um, JavaScript together. I could find out about the future of the internet. So this is exactly what I did. And I thought, Firstly, I'd like to think about the future of, future of business. Now, 2020 is a very different world to the one we live in today. Um, if you think about, uh, if you think about like, the age group and things, I think it's a, a, sort of a standard fact that pretty much everyone under 15 year old, has anyone got 15 year olds or younger children in the audience? Anyone? Pretty much, they spend 95% of their time on Minecraft. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. The thing is, in 2020, they are now our bosses. And they require things done in a more Minecrafty way. So, let's just show, explain what this means. So if I go over to my, uh, uh, my URL here, and I go over to this particular website. I'm going to open up the Chrome. So here I have a, um, a, a website which shows um, sales data. I say sales data because I'm from Microsoft and I can't resist the money. But obviously that's what open source projects we're talking about, so I guess it's actually downloads rather than sales. But um, basically it's a list of the, uh, the, the number of downloads in millions um, between, uh, between 2016 and 2020. And this is pretty standard basic stuff. I'm just using a little single page, page, thread, a single page framework uh, called Knockout. Now, just let's look at the code though, uh, how this is put together. So if I go to sales shut and if you've ever used Knockout before, it's a very straightforward single page application. And um, all that I'm doing is, well the first thing which is quite straightforward is so I've got classes in my JavaScript. This is JavaScript, this isn't TypeScript or CoffeeScript or something compiling into JavaScript, this is just pure JavaScript. And here we have a, a class with AppD model. So in the next version of JavaScript, in the future, they're starting to use classes all over the place. That's, that's, that's how JavaScript is constructed. And I've got a few uh, observable classes, and Various bits and pieces, not really important. Um, one of the things that is quite notable is here we've got a um, we're concatenating a string. So in regular JavaScript, you would put a plus uh, next to two strings to concatenate two strings together. Well, now we have this new way of doing string interpolation, which is um, I'll never say that wrong. Um, we use this back tick notation, this small little back tick, and we put the text in there, and then we use this dollar sign and then sector. And what we'll do is we'll concatenate the string together. So this will actually result in a string URL saying backend sales, dash, and then the sector which we are looking at. And the sector being either Joomla or WordPress.json. That's how it then loads in this JSON file. And we use another new feature in browsers called fetch. If you've done Ajax, maybe you've used, uh, uh, if you've used uh, jQuery or whatever, you might use an Ajax uh, function to go and get stuff from a, from a result. They've actually baked that into browsers and a much more convenient API. It's called fetch and we can put a URL to fetch, it will go and get this, this JSON file, and then it will say dot then. And this is what we call a promise in ECMAScript uh, 6, the next version of JavaScript. So we can then do lots of different things with this document. So what I'm doing in this instance is I'm parsing the response back from JSON, and then I'm passing it into my data for my application. And then doing something with Knockout, which isn't particularly futuristic, you can do that today, but all this other stuff, <coughs> um, classes, the back tick, the arrow function that you can see here, this is just another way of doing an anonymous function. This is all ECMAScript 6, the next version of JavaScript. And basically what it results in is more readable JavaScript. And people will be able to build much larger, more comp complicated JavaScript applications which don't look like hell. Good. Now, it's fine. This is, this is fine, this, this website. But we discussed earlier that people want Minecraft. And this particular sales report is not very Minecrafty. And my future boss in 2020 demands Minecraft charting. 
Now, we could quite easily go and get a Minecraft chat J JS file, but that might, or a, a JavaScript library perhaps, and put that in stuff, but, but that would be the way of doing it today. What about the way that they do it in the future? Well, in the future, they use a thing called Web Components. A Web Components is a, a new standard which is being formalized and built in most major browsers at the moment. I think Chrome are the, ones, the only ones with the current uh, implementation of a major browser, if you're behind flags, but um, you can, uh, but Edge is certainly working on it, and I know all the other browser manufacturers are too. So, let's have a look what Web Components look like. So if we go to index.html, uh, uh, and we look at this little tag. This is a, a semantic tag, it says sales chart. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean anything to the browser, we're just going to ignore that, it's just a, it's just a piece of, uh, just a div, basically, an empty div, really. But what we can do with Web Components is we can use JavaScript to convert those tags into meaningful objects. So let's have a look at sales chart. Up here, I have a new class called sales chart. And you'll see I extend HTML. Because the class structure in JavaScript is, you can have inheritance and all sorts of things. It's proper, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a way of doing you know, class inherit class, more object oriented kind of style of coding in JavaScript, although it's still not object oriented. But let's say we extend uh, the sales chart, the HTML element, and um, what I'm doing in this instance is I'm saying, wherever you basically see that sales chart tag, the inner HTML of that element should result in style, a little style tag, and that's got primary color red, and then I've got a primary, a div class which says my sales data goes here. So basically, if I, if I, save, if I save this and go to my uh, to Chrome, you'll see this thing here, my sales data goes here. This thing here, is my web component. And that web component has that little style element in there. And one of the things you'll see that the problem I might have here is that the red style from my web component has infected my, the rest of my document, the other thing, the outer document. So if you actually look at the HTML of this, uh, over on here, you'll see I have a sales chart, and then I just have a div, which is called outer document. And what's happening is in my web component, it's adding this style, and that style, dot primary, is infecting the outer element as well, which is not what we want. We want encapsulated components that we can reuse within other websites, knowing full well that it's going to be fine, it's just going to work. Okay? So what we can do, instead of um, just setting the dot, dot inner HTML, is we can use a thing called shadow. Bar. So we can say, var shadow equals this dot create shadow root. And instead of saying this dot inner HTML, we say shadow. Shadow. .html, Oop, not this, .shadow, say shadow.html. And what this does is it encapsulates all of the code and, and sort of scopes it specifically to the output of that tag. So now, although .primary is a CSS tag which is being used outside of my, uh, outside of my uh, tag, it should now, go back to the page, it should now no longer affect the outer document. So you'll see that the, the Marseille my sales data goes here is the only thing which is red. This particular thing is now a web component. Well, that's all good and well. We've got like, a little piece of a sort of basic hello world um, <coughs> But let's do something a little bit more interesting with our web component. So you'll see on a, on a web component you have this, these callbacks. This one says created callback. So when this element is created, it will run this, this piece of JavaScript here. So let's think about um, how we might want to build uh, a more complex one. creates a, a similar kind of Minecraft world in my application using WebGL. And then what I do is with Knockout, I'm just taking um, the element, a uh, graph point, and I'm looping through it based on my, um, my sales data. What's interesting here is that I'm not manipulating JavaScript, I'm ma manipulating HTML DOM elements, and they're then being reflected in, in my application. So if I look at the uh, sales chart, the, sorry, the box of world, 
uh, component. I have a voxel graphical component, and it's got when um, when it's uh, created, um, attached, it's going to create a new graph point. When anything gets changed in it, it's going to create a, uh, a new updated graph point. And when the graph point's removed from the DOM, it's going to remove it from my web component as well. So if I'm just adding elements to my DOM, and somehow miraculously this is then being uh, passed into my uh, JavaScript world, my WebGS GL world. So if I go over uh, to here now, what should have happened? Which I can zoom out. My web component is now little Minecraft world, which is good. And what I've tried to do, my mouse will work. You see here, so in my JavaScript Minecraft world, I now have that same data, that table data, but I've bound it using the DOM elements to my uh, my my web. So uh, if I go and change things here, you'll see now it's. Um, my graph is now a model in the Minecraft world. That sales data has been mapped directly to my web component. So what you'll see is that Joomla uh, towards 2012 gets really, really popular. And um, WordPress, not so much, is it? <laughs> 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 uh, interesting there. Uh, I'm going to find so much so, I think, I probably can jump over it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a feature of business. Minecraft, web components. Bruce Lawson, he hears all about web components. He goes off after today's event and creates a new JavaScript framework called Mankini.js. I won't go into the intricacies of what Mankini.js is, but I want to point out the fact that today we live in a world where Bruce can go out tomorrow and decide I want to have the same computing power that Amazon has. I want to have the same computer power, power that Google has. And if he's got a credit card big enough, and I know Bruce, and he has, he can go and buy all of those servers at whim. He doesn't have to go and buy um, you know, hardware. He doesn't have to go and set up the infrastructure and scalability. You can go to Microsoft Azure, or you can go to AWS. You can hire those servers. You can use them and pay for them as much as you like. And you can take your ideas um, and create them into worldwide technology brands in the way that the, the, the Bruce has done here, and change the world without having to spend any more than what you need to in terms of you don't have to go out and buy servers or anything like that. And that's the power <laughs> in the future of the web of what we're able to do. We're able to come up with ideas on a Monday and have them scale them in production by the Friday. It changes the way that business works, it changes the way that web development works massively. Azure is um, our cloud offering. <coughs> And we've been talking a little bit about Azure, and the actual biggest virtual machine, and most people are still familiar with the concept of virtual machines, yeah? The biggest virtual machine that we have in Azure has 448 gigabytes of RAM, which is more than most people's hard drives available. And you can go out and buy 20 of these if you've got enough money, and run your web services and stuff on there in ways that Google and Amazon just couldn't have done years ago when they set up their businesses. Literally. The, the dreams that you have today, you can make real in 2020 with services like this. Weirdly enough, we asked this question on the entrance, and most people said that five terabytes was the largest uh, memory that, that we have in this year, which would be ridiculous RAM, but make you kind of feel really rubbish about this four, four gigabytes. It's the largest <laughs> virtual machine on the planet, but never mind. Um, so you can go create these things and, and build the, the, the stuff uh, tomorrow with this stuff. But the other thing I was interested in was, was, was JavaScript and how that evolved. So I had a look. I had a look over at um, a really cool website called oops, Hitchhiker's Guide. So 
This is the Hitchhiker's Guide to JavaScript. This is a very popular JavaScript front-end website in 2020. Um, I know what you might be thinking, it doesn't look like it's a very popular 2020 design. But the thing is about design and web design in 2020. Oops. Oh, God, this has all gone to tits. <laughs> is, you know, in 1996, Space Jam was a kind of the design forte uh, of, of what we could draw on, on the web. And in 2015, we'd look at this and scoff and laugh and say how ridiculous it is. But in 2020, this comes back in fashion. That JavaScript, the Chinese JavaScript, is the, the creme de la creme of JavaScript. And if you're thinking, that could never happen. Just look at design trendsetters today. <laughs> it's happening in 2015, it's already on its journey. <laughs> so, let's go to here. So, one of the new features in JavaScript, the next version of JavaScript this website's talking about, is um, default functions. So in JavaScript, what is generally the theme is that JavaScript is getting more and more like a real language in terms of like, it's adding more and more features which you see in Java and in C Sharp. And I think that's probably a benefit to the language because it makes, means we can build much more complicated applications. But one of the things that's always been missing from JavaScript is the idea to set a default parameter. So here we've got a, the ability to have a function which takes an X and a Y, and we can determine that the Y does not pass in will be 12 as the default parameter. That's a nice little feature. JavaScript. They've also addressed in, in the next version of JavaScript some of the idiosyncrasies of JavaScript. So for the moment, in most languages, if you do a for in loop um, against an array, a for in, then what will happen is you would get, you would loop for all the values, you'd loop for 3, 5, 7, and you'd get the value. But in JavaScript, when you do a for in, you get logs, <coughs> this particular thing, you get logs uh, 0, 1, 2, and foo. Because rather than looping through the values, it loops through the properties of the objects. It's always been a real pain because most Java people, when they come to JavaScript, make this error because it's not like that in Java, it's not like that in C Sharp, it's not like in any other formalized language really. So what they've done in JavaScript is they couldn't change that behavior, but they've added a new behavior called of. So for of. So if you now loop through an array, for of an array, you can then just log through all the values rather than um, the properties, 3, 5, and 7, as you would expect. So it's just done some nice things. <coughs> I'll talk about Minecraft a little bit. The future of generation um, also have another thing that they like a lot, and that's emoji. Emoji is a very serious business in 2012. The current JavaScript standards dictate that this is valid JavaScript. And by all means, go out and use that piece of JavaScript because it's amazing. Currently, I'm getting loads of red squibblings around everything else, but this is a piece of JavaScript from 2020 when the kids are writing JavaScript, and they are using emojis like you would not believe. And you might be thinking, <laughs> but they do. It's serious emojis. It's serious for danger. Lucky Golden Poo. This is, does anyone recognize this, that emoji? It's one of the most famous emojis on the planet. When you send a text message on an Apple phone, you will get, uh, and you do this particular emoji, you'll get this little um, soft serve emoji. They, they call it the Lucky Golden Poo. In the Unicode definition for once, it's determined as it's called a pile of feces, this, this particular object. <coughs> this is how Windows displays that same thing. <laughs> now you might think it's an accident or we've got a sense of humour. We don't have any eyes, we don't have a little smile or anything like that, we just have a soft serve. <laughs> I love that word, soft serve, I don't know that one. Um, but it actually comes back from this. This is a, a 2012 bug report from the Internet Explorer team. It's genuine, it comes from our, our bug reporting system. And it says, um, Poop emoji doesn't have smiley face. That was the bug which was reported to <laughs> The design team responded, significance of the smile is for lucky golden poo. Yes, it's a real thing. We left the smile out because the Unicode description does not indicate this code point represents lucky golden poo. <laughs> Incidentally, we explored variations with flies around it and steam vapors, but in the end, decided to keep our interpretation literal and true to the Unicode description as we try to do with all of the other characters. Unicode is serious business. It's really serious in 2012. If you don't like it in your JavaScript, you don't get used to it. That's what the kids are going to be doing. And I don't know if you're going that's just amazing. And I know it's on the, on the tip of everybody's tongue here. What are all the other tech companies doing? <laughs> 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 well, 
Um, Twitter, they have um, they have the smiley face, which I thought was really quite nice. The smiley face and stuff on their, their emoji. Google, if you type it into a Google product like Gmail, you will get um, a feces with flies and vapors in the way that, that we decided not to do it. And Facebook have got the weirdest emoji. It doesn't have a mouth, which is strange because everyone I know on Facebook talks shit. <laughs> In the future of JavaScript, we're going to be doing really impressive things with JavaScript. Stuff which is just not possible today. Stuff like asm.js. This is going to be really big. It's, it's a subset of JavaScript which runs really fast. And today, asm.js can get to about 50% speed of, of native C++. So we can start to build things like games engines, <coughs> physics engines, and stuff like asm.js, where we take, um, potentially, uh, C++ plus physics engines, and without changing any lines of code, use asm.js to convert that to JavaScript, then run it in the browser as a virtual machine, effectively never writing any JavaScript in the, at all, but being possible to run that in all kinds of browsers. So the power of asm.js, taking C++, at the moment in 2010, taking C++ and making it run in browsers. But there's no good reason why you couldn't use asm.js to run managed languages like Java or C Sharp, <coughs> scripting languages like PHP or, or, or whatever in the browser effectively. And in the future, we'll be writing less and less actual JavaScript and probably using stuff like asm.js to convert other languages into JavaScript. But we have to use JavaScript because it's the lingo frank, the frank of, the, of the web, really. Um, it's extremely powerful. Um, <coughs> a ship off a shuttle. Yeah. Like that. The other thing is um, the big change in, in JavaScript and, uh, and web browser engines is SIMD. And this is the ability to do multiple processing of, um, of uh, calculations at the same time in parallel. And what this does, what SIMD does, and it's quite a boring sort of topic, but, well, I say boring, it, it's, a, it's a, a topic. And um, it will take data and you can process it in parallel. And this is really useful for games engines, but it's also really useful if you're writing C++ code. And what it will mean is that we can take a JavaScript, uh, JavaScript, which is maybe originally C++, we can convert it into JavaScript, and then we take advantage of the things like SIMD, no longer are we at the half the speed of C++ using JavaScript, we're at the same speed as C++ using JavaScript. And in the future, people will be able to write JavaScript, and it will be comparable in terms of performance with things like C++. It's currently implemented by Intel inside of Microsoft Edge. If you use Microsoft Edge, <coughs> um, Intel committed code into Microsoft Edge to allow SIMD. Google have just added support for SIMD. And um, uh, to the Bing engine, I'm sure that other, lots of, uh, sorry, to the uh, engine. <coughs> And lots of, of more, th more companies will come on board with, with those, um, those with, with support SIMD. But what we'll mean is that JavaScript will be as fast as C++ in 2012. Or close to native speeds. Far closer than native speeds. And really that's what the web becomes. We still use JavaScript, but it's more of a virtual machine. It's a target format. We might write it in C++, but it actually becomes JavaScript later on. Could be Java, could be .NET. <coughs> now I had a huge elaborate machine. And I showed you the future of the web. And not just an interpretation of the web, but the actual future of the web in 2012. We went to real sites, which were genuine twice in 2020, and looked at how they construct them with things like web components. We looked at the future of JavaScript and how that language is evolving, and how it will completely evolve and probably take over the world. And then we saw how we, um, we used all sorts of new features inside of browsers to deliver really fast, fluid web applications that could compete with native applications. But the interesting thing about all of this is that clearly it's all just a ruse. This machine can't be exactly traveled through time, but I wish it could. Um, but the cool thing is, everything I showed you is completely real. SIMD, full speed JavaScript perfusion, emoji, it's all coming true, it's all going to be in a browser near you. So, what I suggest is that if you're thinking about building a web project right now, or you're thinking about the next business, Take it seriously. Go out there. Use the computing power which is at your disposal. It wasn't there five years ago. You couldn't build businesses this quickly in the way that you can today. All of this stuff isn't the future. It's now. It's today. And you can be the next Bruce Lawson. Thank you very much. <laughs>